So Paul, you've shown that we can use the Hubble Space Telescope to get down to about a tenth of an arc second in resolution, which is great compared to what we get at Siding Spring, but we're going to have to probably do better. Uh, and it strikes me that we have here on Earth 10 meter telescopes, but we're going to have to fix the problem of the atmosphere to move forward. Yeah, we're kind of stuck in a bind. If we're on the ground, we have big telescopes, so the refraction limit is very small, but we're mucked up by the atmosphere. If we're in space, you can't put 10 meter telescopes in space, the nose cones of the rockets aren't big enough, so you're stuck with a refraction limit. So wouldn't it be nice if there was some way to cancel out the effects of the atmospheric seeing? And of course there is, kind of. And um, this is a refraction limit pattern with a laser, um, as you get from a space mission. Right, so that's what you would see if you don't have an atmosphere, and we want to be able to try to get that pattern through our big telescopes here on, on Earth. Yep. So to understand this, we have to go from the ray picture of a telescope to a wave picture. So here's how, uh, a ray picture of how a telescope works. You get the light coming in here, the rays. Yep. They bounce off and the primary mirror. And they're coming in from infinity, so they're parallel. Yes. They hit our surface of our mirror. Yep. And then they're focused on the secondary mirror. Not quite focused, but they're directed there. And then that secondary mirror uh, curves them and puts them down through the hole in the back of our telescope. And so this is what we call Cassegrain telescope, so that we can have our imager here and take a picture. Yes. Now let's think of it from a wave point of view. Once again, we've got these infinite parallel waves coming in, and some of them enter the telescope and some just miss. And they come down here and they hit the primary mirror, and the primary mirror is shaped so that the path for every wave coming from infinity should bring it in phase to the focal plane at the same place. Okay. So the outer parts fur have further to travel, so they get intercepted first. So you get a series of more circular waves coming down to the secondary, and that turns into curving slightly the other ways that come down here and come perfectly to focus. Okay. So, so if all's we well, it should turn a perfectly plane parallel wave here into, into a perfectly plane parallel wave again. All focused and brought to a, every point from here to here should have exactly the same path length to add up exactly one point over there. Yep. That's the principle. What does atmospheric seeing do? Well, if cold air, higher refractive index, slows light down. Right. Relative to the speed in normal temperature air. So that means the wave fronts are going to get lagging behind here. Whereas hot air, the air will go a bit faster than on average. And so it'll move forward. So you've now got a distorted wave front coming into the telescope. And so you add that all up in phase, it will give you, um, if Brian steps over a bit, you get oh. the, the sort of pattern like this that we've talked about a before. Mess. That's what a it mess. Gives us. Yes. yes, speaking technically. So what can we do? Well, here's a movie from Gemini showing the concept of adaptive optics, how you correct this. So you get the light coming in, off the primary up to the secondary and down through here. And on the back of the telescope, you have the instrument support structure, which can rotate to cancel out the movement uh, of the, the sky as seen from the telescope. And one arm of that is the adaptive optic system, which is called Altair on Gemini. So you get the light coming in from the top. So the light enters our instrument through the telescope, comes through the hole in the back of the mirror. So it comes the light. And then it's brought into this instrument. Bounce off a mirror, and this is a dichroic. We talked about them a bit before. Um, this sends the infrared light this way, where it gives us an image, a rather blurry image because of the atmospheric seeing, right. whereas the blue light goes over there. So that can be transferred here. And so that light here is, we can look at it in detail. So here come the wave fronts, and as you can see, they're distorted because of atmospheric seeing. So they're not flat pancakes. This is the march of the pancakes, and they're pretty horrible looking pancakes. What we have down here is a wave front sensor that measures the exact distortion and then makes this mirror bend in an equal and opposite way. Ah. So now the pancakes are flattened, and we can make sure we keep on keeping those pancakes flattened. And so when those nice you know, wave fronts, which are all lined up, hit our detector, our star doesn't look blurry it looks like that wonderful pattern. Of course, you have to change the shape of this mirror hundreds of times a second because the atmosphere is always moving. And that's one of the big challenges of this, is that uh, you have to be able to measure with exquisite precision the distortions and measure it 100 times a second. And so that means that you can't just do this on some faint galaxy. You're going to have to have a lot of information in the form of a lot of light 
to actually see what the atmosphere is doing. When trying to direct image exoplanets, you're normally lucky because you typically have a very bright star right there next to your planet. But in general, it's a problem because what you need is a really bright star nearby, yep. which has so much light that even after you've diced it up in all the different ways, you can still measure the distortion with great precision. So what a lot, number of um, telescopes now do is actually create an artificial bright star just where they want it. And the way they do this is what's called a laser guide star system. And once again, here's the example at Gemini North. So there's the laser bolted on the side of the telescope. And this is a sodium laser. And a sodium laser is kind of interesting because our atmosphere has sodium in it. It has a little layer way up uh, in, the, in, in the sky that uh, has sodium atoms in it. And you can excite those, uh, those atoms and literally make a beacon in the sky with this system. Yes, so I'll see that here. So the light goes up. Um, so it's transferred it's transfer to the top of the telescope and then bounced off uh, into the sky from the top. We'll see that in a second here. So we point up to the sky. There we go. We so take a laser beam and it goes very dramatically into space. Here it comes up 50 kilometers, 70 kilometers. And we now hit a sodium layer. This is actually deposited by meteorites primarily. You get meteorites and meteoric dust that land in the upper atmosphere, and they deposit this layer of sodium. Its altitude varies, but maybe about 90 kilometers up. And when we look at that from the ground, so we change our orientation, it looks like a glowing orange dot. This is the same color as sodium streetlights, low-pressure sodium streetlights. And that's giving us a bright artificial star exactly where we want. So uh, as the light comes back down through the atmosphere and back down to our telescope, we can get the light coming in, and we can also look at that sodium artificial star and use that to measure the distortion and correct for it. Kind of interesting. It gets twice the effect. It goes up and down, so it sort of magnifies the effect, and presumably that uh, mm. it has to be corrected for, but can make it a bit easier yep. to, to figure out what's going on with the atmosphere. So you get the dual of the lightsabers here at uh, Mauna Kea. Um, you can see the laser coming from Gemini, and also from the Keck telescopes in the background. And presumably so it's curved, not only because of the optics of our picture that we're taking. Yeah, I think it's taken with a fisheye lens. It's quite difficult to operate these things. They have to make absolutely clear there are no aircraft around. So they have lots of students up there whose job it is to look at one quarter of the sky and have a big red button and say, turn it off now, there's an aeroplane coming over. They also have to unif notify US Space Command ahead of time. Uh, we're going to look at these targets at these times. Please tell us if we shouldn't. We wouldn't want to blind a uh, downward-looking uh, device. So that's adaptive optics.